Hello, everyone. Welcome to the fourth webinar. Welcome to the Millennium Fellowship webinar. We are excited and we are glad to have you here. Um, we are really, really excited. This promises to be a very, very interactive, a very, very interactive time and session where we get to learn from uh, where our guest is also ready for us. I'm very sure he's ready to take us through um, his path and his journey in the social impact world and social entrepreneurship. So straight away, we'll be going into our session now. Um, I would implore us to use the chat box, please. Um, we'd like to know you, we'd like to know your name, we'd like to know your university, we'd like to know your country, we'd like to know a little about you. So yeah, let's use the chat box. Let's just get, um, let's get going, please. Let's use the chat box, let's know your name. You can start with your name, you can start with your country, you can start with your university and let's begin the networking from there. It's um, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you Millennium Fellows for the class of 2023 here. And okay, I would like to give a brief introduction. I'd like to introduce myself formally. So my name is John Oluwa Demlade. I'm a Millennium Fellow and also a campus director for Obafemi Awolowo University, cohorts B. And um, one of the reasons why I joined the Millennium Fellowship is because it promised uh, it's, in, it's an opportunity for me to interact, it's an opportunity for me to network, it's an opportunity for me to get to know people, get to meet people who are also like-minded like me, who also have similar interests and um, passion in the things I do. I mean, my project is simply genital health education technology, and, um, and I really think that um, what my project seems to do is to bridge the gap between food between your health and between technology because really I'm a technology student and I'm just like seeking for ways and you know methods to not only educate but also impact people with the right knowledge. Um, also our guest speaker is here already. Welcome Steve Fox, welcome you once again to the Millennium Fellowship class of 2023 and I would go right into it. I would give a little um, I know some of you would have seen, I mean, those of you that are curious like I am, we would have done a little bit of research on our guest to know a little bit about him. But then don't worry, if you haven't, I will be sharing who, uh, a little bit of insight to what and who he really is. To you. So, um, let, Mr. Steve Fox, we are excited to have you here once again. So who is Steve Fox? Um, Steve Fox is an international business leader and he is experienced in climate, education, and social enterprise. For the past five years now, Steve was the CEO of Impact Global Education. At IGE, Steve managed four brands in the international development and education space. With offices in 13 countries around the world, IGE delivered impactful programming in social entrepreneurship years and volunteering in the refugee, health and education spaces. Steve comes from an international development and investment background, previously serving as CEO of Think Impact and Managing Director at Sunizero Investment in Sub-Saharan Africa. So now I'll be handing the debating over to Steve now. Steve, would like to hear from you. Would like to just give us an opening remark as we begin this session. Thank you, John, and thank you to uh, the MCN and the United Nations Academic Impact, uh, and congratulations, um, fellows. Um, I'm really uh, thrilled to be chatting with you this morning, afternoon, evening, uh, wherever you are. Um, yeah, so um, I, I'm happy to uh, tell you a little bit about myself, give a, a brief overview of um, you know uh, who I am and why I'm here speaking to you. Um, and then really use the uh, the rest of the time to focus on your questions. Um, and I know the theme uh, of this year is emerging technologists, which is a um, is something really near and dear to uh, me in the multiple hats that I wear. Um, uh, but in in particular, as it relates to pressing issues of climate change and um, and uh, the relevant um social issues that that uh result from climate change um but let me start uh i'm uh, i'm uh, speaking to you from boston uh massachusetts here in the united states um where i'm from originally uh but my journey um 
uh, including with the MCM, has taken me uh, to live in a couple of other countries. Um, uh, after my time in university, uh, actually, uh, I'll start by saying uh, when I uh, when I was an undergraduate at the University of Richmond, um, uh, I was in the first class of interns for the Millennium Campus Network. Um, a very long time ago now. Uh, I won't age myself nor the MCN. Um, and my first job at the MCN was to, um, among other things, to uh, help find speakers uh, for for conferences and relevant events, help find where I'm sitting uh, for you now. Although in particular at the time I was focused on um, uh, big, big celebrity style names uh, because uh, they attracted a lot of eyeballs, uh, but also folks who are deeply committed to a uh, uh, an approach to take on at the time the Millennium Development Goals, now the SDGs, um, with uh, this commitment that I think many of you uh, um, share today to lead with empathy, humility, and inclusion as guiding values. Um, so after my internship and then subsequently working to help the MCN in a little bit more detail, I um, uh, for another year after that, um, after my time in university, I went on to, um, <laughs> I, I both started <laughs> my journey in oceans and climate, oceans being a really central part of the work that I um, do now, um, and also uh, led me to Sub-Saharan Africa where I started my work in um, uh, in social impact and social entrepreneurship. Um, so I'll kind of give you uh, the the oceans side of it on one hand, and then I'll give you the um, my you know my day job. Um, so on the ocean side, I I I became really enamored by the potential of oceans, coastal communities, uh, ocean faring industry, um, and really the power of the oceans as a uh, you know as in its ability to combat climate change um, and to work to mitigate um, the untold harm that we've done to our planet in the last, um, in particular, in the last 100 and 150 years. Um, and I got there because I had a weird uncle. I'm sure many of you have weird uncles who gave me a, this, book yeah. was, this book. It was pretty bad, but it was um, it, it was also kind of interesting about um uh how the ocean um, how the ocean could be um a, a tool uh against uh climate change and in particular how the ocean really was the lungs of our planet um which i really like the ocean does breathe every day and so from there i got really involved in uh in a lot of um campaign like approaches um to the oceans following on to the work of other leaders student leaders uh, young leaders in social and climate impact, um, and then became more involved as uh, on the grant making and investment side of oceans. Um, and over the last 15, 16 years, um, since then, since my university days uh, getting involved with oceans, I've become a grant maker through the Remmer Family Foundation into the ocean space, supporting, among other things, the Money Emotions Prize um, at the MCN, uh, but also making investments in young leaders, social entrepreneurs who are taking on um, uh, ocean climate issues. Um, and I now embody that both in my role as a trustee at the Rimmer Family Foundation on the grant making and investment side and as a partner at Propeller, which is a venture capital firm that makes investments in entrepreneurs focused on ocean climate. Um, to get there, I had to have day jobs kind of along the way. Uh, it was it was more of a I spent my nights and weekends, you know, on calls like this, meeting other young leaders and learning uh, about their their attention to the ocean. Um, but I started as uh, essentially like work an analyst um, and working with um, an investment firm that was focused on. Um, uh, geothermal and solar energy deployment in, uh, as John mentioned, in sub-Saharan Africa in particular. I worked out of, and I don't know if there's anybody from, uh, Mozambique, uh, Madagascar, Cameroon, uh, and Malawi, where I lived the longest and met my uh, my now, uh, now uh, wife. Um, I, um, uh, I was there just over three years working with awesome social entrepreneurs, 
Um, uh, I, I, in addition to doing this kind of large scale energy work, um, I also got to learn about sustainable agriculture and made investments in social entrepreneurs in that space and helped them, um, as well as uh, financial technologies. Um, uh, I, I moved on from, uh, from that experience to graduate school in London, uh, where I focused on economics um, and coming out of um, uh, graduate school, um, one of the investors who I'd met along my journey uh, recruited me into, as John mentioned, this role that I had at Think Impact. Um, and this is where my, uh, my attention to social entrepreneurship really blossomed from what I spent uh, uh, my side time doing to what I spent every day doing. Um, and I think in fact, <laughs> I worked with um, social entrepreneurs uh, in rural parts of um, largely the global South um, and with um, students from institutions uh, across the world uh, to take on uh, design thinking approaches to social entrepreneurship. Um, uh, I facilitated uh, programs, incubators, accelerators to uh, focus on building small businesses um, out of uh, social entrepreneur ideas that really combined across cultures. Um, I did that for five years along the journey. Um, as John mentioned, I I, um, I led what was a roll-up strategy. So it started as a quite small business with you know three or four of us, uh, me leading the team. And then we added um, a couple of team members and then as we hit success milestones, we then added um, uh, we added other folks to the team and then eventually bought um, a series of companies that did uh, really parallel um, uh, approaches um, and buttressed what we were doing and grew the team uh, to about 100 folks working in 15 countries, supporting a wide range of social entrepreneurship uh, activities and social impact activities. Um, I ran that company until, um, until really the beginning or actually into the, uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, and there were kind of two major things that shifted in my life during that time. Uh, one was that, uh, I had my first daughter and I now have two small daughters, um, and they were, uh, totally life-changing in the way that I thought about what was important and how I wanted to spend my time. Um, uh, and, um, and I think about my entrepreneurial journey as being important to spend my, spend time at the middle of a, um, a Japanese principle called Ikigai. Um, uh, and so when my daughter, first daughter was born, I really began to think about my Ikigai and Ikigai is a Venn diagram. So imagine four circles, uh, and the intersection of those circles is the important part. And one circle is what you like to do. One circle is what you're good at doing. One circle is what you can get paid to do in a lifestyle that fits for you and yours, uh, your family. Uh, and the last one is what um, what you want to contribute to the world um, and what what's an important contribution to the world for you. Um, and I think the honest conversation that I had with myself was that... Um, I was missing the the thing that I liked and the impact that I wanted to make on the world. Um, and for me, that was to focus on um, on climate change, uh, not only as nights and weekends, but as an important part of uh, every single day. So I encourage each of you to, at some point, uh, just take a cursory approach to doing the Ikigai exercise and then revisiting it from time to time, um, because it led me to uh, move on to Propeller, uh, where I am now, which is this $120 million venture fund uh, that's partnered with a place called the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and funds entrepreneurs, many of whom, like yourself, are taking on important ocean climate issues uh, to scale them. In addition to uh, my work at Propeller, um, I mentioned I'm a trustee at the Remmer Family Foundation, which makes grants in two areas. Um, one is uh, oceans. Uh, the other is uh, girls empowerment and girls education. Uh, uh, both of these are, uh, uh, we make grants and investments around the world. Um, same with Propeller. Uh, and then I'm also on the board of a place called the Network for Engaged International Donors, which is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, a bunch of donors who are focused on international uh, issues. 
Um, and I've been on the board there for some time. And then I'm on the board of a number of startups who um, I'm trying to help in their growing journey. Um, but I'm really, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm excited to, uh, to focus on um, sp speaking to tech for impact um, and can certainly offer uh, any advice there, um, but really excited to meet all of you um, and hear about what you're working on. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. Okay. Wow. That was a very, very, that was a very, very enlightening session. I mean, what really stood out for me, and I'm very sure it stood out for a number of millennial fellows, was when you mentioned the AK Guide diagram. That is something that I would advise myself and every other person to, to try out because, I mean, it's just kind of sounds more like a self discovery. And like when you just begin to you know, ask yourself questions and you just begin to evaluate yourself personally. So if you'd ask me, I would advise for myself and to other millennial fellows out there to really, really um, try out the AI, just as Steve has mentioned. So right away, I'll be going into um, a few questions. Um, Mr. Steve, we have a few questions for you. I mean, we are really, really here to hear from you, to get, you know, inspired and to learn from you and to, you know, see a lot of things. So yeah, my first question is, every social impact project start with a story. I mean, every social impact project, every um, everything that has been started starts with a story. So could you like share with us how your story with social entrepreneurship and social impact began? I mean, you kind of shared a little bit of an insight, but then just like, yeah, just, just share with us how your social entrepreneurship and social impact journey really, really began because every great man has one or two stories to tell. So we are really interested in your story, sir. Thanks, John. Yeah, uh, you, you use a good you use a good phrase that uh, I'll work off of, which is every great man starts uh, starts with a story. Uh, every my story starts with a great woman, which is my mom. Uh, and my mom, uh, uh, her career was in um, working in something called. Uh, philanthropic advising. So she helped essentially wealthy people around the world figure out how to make grants um, and how to do grant making and allowed me to see the pr through the prism of uh, a lot of a wide variety of um, different uh, different social entrepreneurs who are working, who are receiving grants um, and the folks who are funding them as well. And so my story really starts with I was, uh, oh my gosh, what, I was, I think I was in sixth grade in the U.S. So for context, let me see, that's like 10 years old. Um, and we were, uh, I was tagging along with my mom on one of her work trips to, um, uh, or I guess maybe it wasn't a work trip, but I was tagging along with her to um, Tanzania. Um, and we went to visit a school that she was involved with. Um, and at the time we were visiting students who were the exact same age as me, um, just, uh, studying the same subjects on a different side of the world. Um, and one, uh, and I met, uh, the principal of their school among other folks who really, uh, encouraged me to think about, um, you know, what were the things that were making my education journey successful? Um, and what were the things that were holding me back? And then to reflect that in what I was seeing um, in the school that I was visiting in Tanzania. Um, and uh, and so at the time I had had like a really simplistic approach to how I thought about it. And one of them was like, you know, simple things that give you back time in your day, um, but, but are undervalued. And so I went back and raised money to help uh, work on some infrastructure at the school and work with the principal. Um, but then it became really clear that uh, that was really simplistic thinking, um, albeit coming from a very good place. And so uh, the story from there was working with my mom to figure out what were, you know, what were the um, the 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 things that I could work on collaboratively with folks to understand what they as customers uh, or they as consumers or they as collaborators um, would find um, most exciting uh, or most intriguing what was filling what I would call like uh, one of their their burning problems what was helping them with one of the things their hair on fire problems that they couldn't solve. Um, 
And for me, that was really the first time I had engaged with something I now call customer discovery, which is normally called customer discovery. Um, but it's uh, it's an important thing for every social entrepreneur to figure out. And I really reflect back on my mom teaching me about it, which was to spend a lot of time being a very active listener. Um, so from that like really simplistic experience where I kind of listened and then took my own interpretation, um, I think the thing that really blasted me off was my mom interpreting back to me that an important step for me to take was to not just have one conversation and think that I had the problem solved, but to speak to all the stakeholders involved in any particular operation and figure out the niche that uh, I would take on. Um, and a lot of the time that niche uh, I've found since then could be attacked by the deployment of um, really breakthrough technologies. Oh, wow. That was a very, very great story. I mean, one of the things that stood out to me was the fact that you said um, you actually went out of your way to like solve problems, to solve issues. So you, it's not like you just kind of like overlooked them. You actually made intentional efforts to get this problem solved. But then I'm curious though, I have a question for you, sir. Um, when, in, um, okay, so let's say you kind of like found out the problem and then you're trying to make solution and probably the solution involves you raising money or just going into business. I mean, you mentioned the time where you worked with about four people just to start up a business. But then I'm wondering, um, is it every business that turned out the way you wanted it to turn out or were there some businesses that just didn't go as planned? And if they were, how did you manage to like undo that situation? What was your mindset? What was your, did you like detail your motive? Did it kind of bring you down or you just, so let, we'd like to know, I'd like to know that. I'd like to. Oh, John, I have spent so much time dealing with businesses that have gone wrong, including those that I've run. Uh, it's actually in any entrepreneur's journey, uh, you got to celebrate the times where you have big wins because like 90% of the time you're dealing with things that are stressing you out or that um, are going absurdly wrong. <laughs> so I'll, I'll give you one example, which is, um, or I'll give you, you one, one solution, which is, um, you know, I think one of the things that uh, a lot of folks will focus on is like, I need uh, the, mo I need the money uh, to attack A, B, and C. And you can create a budget um, and you can be really firm to what you're working on. Um, one of the things that I think makes a really good entrepreneur, and it's something that I did a okay job of, but I feel like I could get better and better with it every time, is, can, is to have conviction in your purpose but uh, but the, the conviction on the way that you get to that purpose uh, to be loosely held. Uh, which is to say that uh, in the example of how you resource uh, taking something on or when something's going uh, poorly, uh, to take the plan that you spent hours and hours and hours or days working on and throw it out the door and start again from where you had. So I'll give you a, a, like a really concrete example. Um, I was working with one fantastic entrepreneur um, who was uh, based out of Gabon, um, I don't know if anybody here from uh, Gabon Libreville, I'm sorry for the uh, uh, the challenges your country is going through right now. Um, but um, but the uh, this entrepreneur was starting a small business that was essentially like a a, a mushroom farm. They were going to use the mushrooms for all sorts of different really cool medicinal medicinal and cosmetic purposes. Um, uh, and he pitched me on this, uh, on this idea, like 15 different times. He came to me with 15 different business plans. And each time I kind of said to him, I, I, I know what to do with this business plan. Like it's, it's ambitious. You're thinking outside the box and you clearly have conviction on what you want to do, but the way you're getting there is just like, not, not an approach that's financeable, not an approach that, uh, is like, is realistic to the timeline that you're talking about. Um, and he was really in a tough place. Like I, I, he kept pushing through. I can only imagine the hardship that he had to go through to figure out where he was going going to. Uh, but one of the things he could just come to him was he kept he kept the core piece of the business alive, the core piece of his entrepreneurship journey alive by 
continuing to always grow more mushrooms and create new products every single day and experimenting with new things. And eventually he got to a place where he stumbled across a product that was really neat and uh, essentially became the basis for a mushroom based tea uh, that had, uh, you know, um, nutritional benefits to it. Uh, and it was definitely not where he started. Uh, and definitely he had a lot of hard time with a lack of money in between. But when he stumbled across this thing, he talked to enough folks. It was an appealing enough product. The the folks who worked for him and the farmer, the other farmers he sourced from understood it and were behind the mission and it worked out for him. Uh, uh, but start with it, be can have conviction in what you want to achieve, uh, but loosely hold those convictions and how you're going to get there. Okay. Well, that was a very nice one. I hope our Millennium Fellows out there, I hope you are all taking notes and chatting. I mean, another thing that stood out for me is when you have a business plan, even if it doesn't work out the first time, you go again for it, you go again for it, and over and over and again. And another thing that stood out for me was when he said the man from Carbon didn't lose his core. So you must stay true to the core. You must stay true to what exactly the purpose of the business really is. So in terms of modification, modifying your business ideas, in terms of refining it, you should ensure you don't lose what the core value and the core services you like to render. So um, right away, we'll be going into our question and answer session. We'll be opening the ground. We'll be opening the floor for um, our Millennium Fellows. Those of you who have questions, you can just drop them in the chat box or you could just raise your hands and I'll be calling a few fellows to just um, share their questions and to just let us um, get to interact more on this space. So yes, um, let me start by, okay, let's see, okay. Um, I'll be calling on Vincent Oma. I hope I got the pronunciation right. If I didn't, I'm really sorry. I really apologize for that. Um, Vincent Oma, you have the floor. Please proceed to ask your question. Okay. <clears throat> thank you for this opportunity. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Stephen Fox, for the knowledge and the impact. It has really improved our thinking capacity. So my question is about... Uh, uh, you see, in, as an entrepreneur, like I think there's this notion like you have to have a team, a team with like people who should work with, people who are there to like support you. And uh, uh, some of us, like for example, me, I find it difficult working with uh, like working with the guys, especially in the in in uh, in youths, my fellow peers. So it, it's gonna it's like a lot of challenges. Like people see like. They, 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 they are some, sometimes they, they, they seem to be active, at the time they are dormant. If you engage them in some activities, some of them will, a few will turn out, some of them they don't turn out. So how do you handle this teamwork? Like, one of your fellow peers to contribute to your, to your, to your plan? Yeah, Thank that's you. a great question. Nice to meet you, Vincent. Thanks for, thanks for asking the question. I, um, yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of different styles of leadership for uh, best engaging your peers um, and, and thinking about it. Uh, what's always worked for me the best is uh, servant leadership, um, which is thinking about um, uh, aligning uh, aligning folks around a common mission and then being the supporting infrastructure for them as a leader instead of um, leading by... Um, uh, leading by a mandate or leading by uh, with with your your vision out in front and you out in front of your vision, um, but it, it depends on the st the style. I think um, the th uh, one of one of the lessons that we've really uh, talk about a propeller um, a lot is um, a really good entrepreneur has kind of two, there there are two pieces that I would focus on for a really, really good entrepreneur. A really good entrepreneur it does an excellent job of thinking about recruitment and thinking about professional development all the time of the folks that they're working with. And what I mean by that is not only how does this person, how can I um, attract folks and draw a pathway for them where they can see their growth in, in the business and the organization, they can see their pathway in addition to how the organization itself will, will grow. Uh, 
I think it's important to realize that um, any organization is made up of the uh, the you know the paths of a lot of individuals and not just uh, the path of the organization. Um, uh, and then thinking about thinking about and checking in uh, regularly with those folks to make sure that they're they can continue to see the clarity in that path, or if they feel that their path is changing or something else is more important, that you would recheck back with them. The other one that I would use is. Um, uh, is a lesson that I, I won't take credit for. It comes from an entrepreneur uh, who uh, is controversial, but uh, but very successful. Um, and he speaks about um, a good organization runs when you align vectors. Um, any organization is coll a collection of people, and each person is a vector. Um, there are small vectors, there are thick vectors, there are long vectors, uh, and ve vector could be productivity, vector could be, um, you know, um, you know, how well liked, uh, what a good team builder that person is, or vector could be anything. The job of a leader is not to increase the length of a vector or the width of a vector. It's not to, it's, uh, the first job um of a leader is to align vectors and make sure they're all headed in the same direction um and uh and so often i'll see an organization and it's so clear because i've seen so many uh enterprises now where there'll be vector people will be doing things and they're not complementary each other they're all not moving in the same direction and i think the best leaders are able to pick out and say, hey, you have all these vectors and you might be kind of moving in the same direction, but how do we move together? Um, and to do it in a way, again, that is uh, respectful of that person uh, and uh, and helps with their personal journey and their personal growth. Um, nobody should ever expect that um, you, you one person is gonna work with you forever. Um, you, you should be respectful of how does this fit in their journey? Thank you. Right on, Vincent. Uh, Great question. All right. Um, thank you for that wonderful question. I'd also be reading someone's question from the chat box. Um, a fellow asked, how do I start an NGO with no funds or grants? So that's question for you. That's a good question. Write it down and tell the world about it. You guys are all on a Zoom call right now. Uh, and like, all right, you can set like you can set up all the infrastructure. You can register with your state. You can do whatever it is. I think the more important thing is just to start doing the work. Um, I think it's really important not to misrepresent yourself, not to call yourself an NGO when you're not registered and whatnot. But you can call yourself an organization. You can say we're an organized group of people doing X um, without registering. Uh, I don't want to jump ahead. Some of the country, uh, from my experience, some of the countries you may be working in might have to <laughs> against that. Not exactly sure, but a, but a, but generally speaking, just start doing the work. Um, the reality is, uh, a lot of the other stuff, uh, the setting up of the NGO, the funding of the NGO, is window dressing to the the core elements of doing the good work that you're working on. I, uh, I. Uh, <laughs> I, I usually subscribe to the uh, principle that it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Um, uh, and certainly on this point, um, without funding, without being officially registered, just start doing the work. Um, and then uh, you'll quickly find that with momentum, those other pieces will catch up behind it. Great question. Thank you. Steven, I think we've lost uh, Oluwadi Miladi here, but uh, we have a couple of hands raised. I'll, I'll call on Boluatife Daramola if you just want to introduce yourself first and then ask your question. Boluatife? All right, as you wait on Boluatife, I'll call on Ebenezer Kori. Are you able to unmute yourself? Yeah. Yes. No. Can I, can I, can I be heard? Yep. Yes. I can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. And uh, my name is uh, Kori Ebenezer. I'm from Kenya. And I have uh, just a quick question for you. Uh, uh, what is the most valuable lesson you have learned from your entrepreneur, entrepreneurial journey and how has it influenced your approach to architectural history and education regarding your career journey? How has it uh, influenced your approach to architectural history and uh, education? Cool. 
Uh, thanks, Ebenezer. Um, you guys are really uh, hitting me with the softball questions. Uh, that uh, that's a tough one. Let me think about it. Um, I uh, most important lesson. I mean, the most important lesson is just the for me has been the experience of like perseverance is so much more important than everything else in entrepreneurship. Um, like there will be a thousand times where you want to quit. It makes sense to quit. You're, uh, you're not, you're watching your peers do better than you on basically every metric. Like they're making more money. Their parents and grandparents are more proud of them. Uh, their friends understand what the hell they're doing. Uh, there's just so many times. Um, but if you really believe in what you want to do um, and you can always keep pushing through those, those um, challenges. Um, and it's been extremely uh, influential to me in that like now I, I don't, I, I generally believe most things are, are possible with enough hard work. Uh, what it, what it means now for me and my role of uh being a venture capitalist and the grant maker is I really love folks with audacious visions, um, audacious visions. And then I love learning about the individual and making sure that their, their personal path to date, it can be professional, but also personal, personal and professional path is reflective of those folks that have shown the ability to persevere. Um, uh, I'll give a very brief example and a shout out to a company that we're invested in called Navier, N-A-V-I-E-R. Um, uh, and my friend and our, uh, the CEO of that company is a lady named, Sempr named Sempriti. Um, uh, and I encourage you to look her up. She's uh, She's got an incredible journey of perseverance uh, and an audacious vision. Um, and, uh, and she's one of, you know... Um, a dozen entrepreneurs that I'm currently working with uh, who I feel the same about that they are incredibly audacious um, and show a history of perseverance. All right. Thank you, Steve, for that. We'll also be entertaining another question from Bolua Tife Daramola. I can see you have your hands raised. Can you please unmute yourself and just let us have your question? Bolua Tife Daramola, are you there, please? Okay, um, let's have another question from Salvia Saira. Please, let's have your question. Salvia Saira, I can see that your hand is raised. Okay, yeah. thank you for giving me the platform to ask the question. So um, my question was, um, when did your business start? Like how it's different from now? Like what did it look um, at the very beginning and how does it look now? Like what is the transition of the business? As well as I had another question, um, which is uh, what would you suggest us young entrepreneurs who want to be like uh, entrepreneurs in the future? What do we do with the fear and doubts we have while starting a business? Thanks, Alwa. Uh, again, hit me with another softball. Uh, okay, uh, I... Um... Yeah, the my where it started. It started with uh in this most recent thing in, in Propeller, what I'm working on right now. It started with five people in a room uh for months trying to figure out what the path was gonna be, working through the plans, talking to all the stakeholders would be involved and asking them what it would look like with nothing, just an ideas and a space where we could meet and talk. Uh it is transitioned to a $120 million venture capital fund um, that has made 11 investments and is about to make our 12th investment uh, with now uh, a dozen people working. Um, uh, I think those first, first uh, uh, four or five months of us just sitting in the room, sitting in this room, working through how we were going to approach this, challenging each other, being honest, being humble, <clears throat> um, uh, not uh, realizing um, that uh, that these conversations were not sunk cost as we threw something out, but uh, an opportunity to learn from each other. Uh, that was super, super important. Um, 
yeah, I, um, I, I can't stress enough the, the, the time that goes into that exploration journey being really important. Um, uh, your second question was about fear and doubt. Um, I believe, um, uh, oh my gosh, like all, all the time. Um, you're, you're blessed by this group that you have here. Like I, I, um, I would harness a, a group of peers like this of the other fellows to speak openly um, and vulnerably about your fear and doubt with each other, um, knowing that you have other people who are going through the same thing. One tool that I uh, use and I recommend to other people is when I'm taking on something that's intimidating to me, um, I a, a recruit an accountability partner. Um, a lot of people are like, I need a... a a lot of the, if you want a, a really common thing I see is some like a young person, like many of you will come to me uh, uh, and will be like, hey, can you mentor me on what I'm doing? Meh, I, I feel OK about that. Um, I think it's important to learn from uh, the wisdom of the other uh, of other folks who've been along a journey. Um, I wouldn't discount it. But one thing that I see, never see young folks doing and I really encourage is to find accountability partners, to find your peers who are along the same journey where you can share your fears and your doubts, your ambitions in a way that feels safe to you. And they can, sh and, and you have to return it. You share it right back with them. Um, and then your, your biggest responsibility besides listening to each other is to hold each other accountable, to check in with each other and challenge each other to overcome those fears and doubts um, or to move towards um, the mission that you uh, shared with uh, your accountability partner. Um, that is completely underrated. Uh, and everybody here has absolutely no excuse not to do that because I'm in a room with, oh, there's 500 of you in here. There's 500 people who could be your accountability partner. Um, so no excuses. Find somebody like that. All right. Thanks, Steve, for that. Um, I'll also ask you a question that we have for you. Um, how do you keep yourself motivated in your social impact journey? Because at times, due to complexities of the wider social, political, and economic structures that are not always supportive or accessible, so how do you keep yourself motivated in your social impact journey along the years? So how do you keep going? What motivates you? What? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I'm motivated by two things, uh, primarily. Um, one is I mentioned I have two young daughters, um, and it is unbelievable motivation to work on climate change and the social effects that will come out of that uh, by my two young daughters so that they don't grow up in a desert. Um, uh, the second thing that motivates me is um, I work in ocean climate change, right? Uh, and uh, you hear a lot of things that will uh scare you about sea level rise the thing that scares me um is i mentioned that i lived in a number of places uh particularly in the global south uh i don't worry about sea level rise i worry about big weather events uh and catastrophic climate events that will flood uh and salinate uh add salt water to clean water aqua aquifers that people drink out of and there will be no clean water for people to drink from those events, and they will have to move to places of clean water. Um, and I worry about that today uh, and in the next 10, 15 years. So those are both the the fear-driven things that motivate me and keep me going. Uh, uh, the other, the, the really positive stuff is that motivates me is I surround myself with people who believe there are solutions to the problems that uh, we're facing. Um, and ocean scientists really, and, and I really fundamentally believe that the ocean can get us out of this pickle. It's gotten us out of the pickle before. Uh, I encourage you guys to look up something called the Azola Fern. Uh, and the last time we had a real climate catastrophe like this, which was, uh, when volcanoes were basically spouting out all over the place and the Azola Fern, uh, and other things have helped us get out of it. And they are, uh, ocean-based technologies. Um, so I really believe in human ingenuity, human ingenuity to replicate um, some of those incredible opportunities and to produce technologies that will help get us out of this uh, pickle. All right, thank you so much. 
um, we'll be entertaining a question from someone in the chat room. So our question is, she's interested in applying for the Ocean Prize Award. So can you just give her a rundown on how to apply it and the necessary things she has to know about it? So that's a question, basically, how to apply for the Ocean Prize Award. Sorry, Stephen, you're muted. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Can yes. you hear me? Yeah? Okay, cool. Uh, how to apply for the Ocean's Prize. Um, Everybody who's working on any ocean issue, coastal issue, water issue, please check out the Millennium Oceans Prize. It's incredible. Our friends here at the uh, Millennium Campus Network do an unbelievable job of uh, supporting it. <laughs> um, you can, I'm pretty sure you can just apply online. There's a Millennium Campus website, Millennium Campus Network website. Um, I would encourage you uh, I'm, I'm really excited to hear that there are other folks applying. I'd also encourage you to follow the campaigns of the winners, both previous winners and then this year's winner, which I believe is to be announced very soon, as well as any runner-ups. I would engage yourselves in those campaigns because you can learn a lot from them and how they uh, applied, how they won, what they're working on. And by supporting their campaigns, you only give yourself a, a better shot at um at uh, becoming a winner yourself. But it, in, in the interim, it, it's an incredibly important, the, the current campaigns that are running are incredibly important, um, deeply thought through and run by exciting leaders from your fellow community. Thank you, Stephen. And perhaps just to add on to that response. Um, so as Stephen mentioned, the Millennium Motions Prize winners will be announced really, really soon. That's for the ninth prize. And then within the next, uh, in the next couple of weeks uh, or months, we should be opening applications for the 10th of uh, Ocean's Prize. I just put the link in the chat box. Um, you can check it out and it will also be shared with you via the newsletter once applications are open. Back to you, John. Thanks, James. All right. Thank you for that. We'll be entertaining a final question from someone whose hand is still raised. Um, Solomon Obiara, can you please add your question? And that will be the last question for today. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hey, Solomon. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for the presentation and then the answers. It really enlightened me. Um, my question is um about um social impact and then entrepreneurship. Um, how 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 do you focus on both? Because um I, I'm starting a business. Like then I am also the co-founder of uh, uh, an organization, a non-government organization. So I, I want to know how how to balance both your work at the organization and also your work as an entrepreneur so that it will not conflict with both. How would you advise me to do that? Thank you. Yeah, um, I would advise you, it's a good question. I would advise you to not focus on being good at both, but be great at one to start and then build up the strength to be great at another. Um, I I think um, it can be, I think you can, I often think about um, uh, spreading yourself across multiple things as being uh, one thing where you're leading at and one thing where you're supporting or what I like to be called being a wing um, uh, to somebody else on. Um, uh, and, and, um, and so, uh, as you're approaching it, I would think about, um, realistically about the time that you can commit to, um, to each of these different in endeavors, what it will take, the time it will take and your, how your background is a fit for leading in the one, um, and for, um, being supportive or leading in the second, um, especially at the stage that you, you all are at. I think um, uh, spreading yourself across a lot of things can be really important in giving you exposure. But if you really want to build something um, to dedicate yourself, um, dedicate yourself to it, but also support your other interests, but be uh, be more on the supportive side. Um, although uh, you are all far more exceptional than I ever was by virtue of your, your fellowship here. So perhaps many of you are capable of uh, leading multiple endeavors at once. So I won't jump out in front of that. All right, thank you so much, Steve. We had a very, very amazing time with you. I'm very sure a lot of fellows 
learned a lot of, I mean, my Jota is full of various, I mean, I got a lot of things. I learned a lot of things from the social enterprise world to climate, to social impact, and just kind of like boosted and just granted me more clarity. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for, for taking out time to just speak to us fellows of class 2023. We really appreciate and would like to have your closing remark. We'd like to have your closing remark. We'd like you to just give us a closing remark. Just, you know, talk to us and just give us a charge as we bring this um, webinar to an end. Yeah, and thank you, John. You've done a great job asking questions and facilitating. Uh, congratulations on your leadership there. Um, I, uh, yeah, uh, you're an incredible group of young folks, clearly dedicated to some of the most important issues that face us today. Um, my advice is not, it, you know, it should be one in a chorus of advice that you should be receiving from incredible folks um, and, and managing um, as best you as best you want towards the, the goals that you're taking on. Um, I, I would encourage each of you to uh, try some of the tools I suggested today. Try the Ikigai. Try thinking about how you really fit into the middle of that Venn diagram and what's going to drive you. Try using each other as accountability partners. Um, uh, uh, don't feel alone or isolated um, uh, because there's 500 of you. Um, and I, I think if I asked you to raise your hands right now for who would be an accountability partner to anyone else on this call, my guess is we would get 90, 95% of the people to raise their hands here um, uh, by virtue of what you're, you're leading with. So um, so I think you can uh, you can rely on each other um, to help you, and you should. Um, and yeah, I'm uh, I'm here to support as best I I can. I'll leave my um, the best place to reach me is usually through uh, my LinkedIn. Um, so I'll, I'll put my uh, I'll put my LinkedIn um, in in the chat here, um, uh, just because. I have way too many email accounts um, and don't check them enough. Uh, but I will, um, I, I can usually respond and get back uh, in a week or so. Um, and yeah, I um, I would encourage you to lean on the incredible folks here at the Millennium Campus Network. They're extremely uh, well set up to help you. Um, and again, congratulations to all of you fellows. Um, it's, a, it's a tremendous honor. And I, uh, I've got a, uh, high hopes for each and every one of you. And I'll put my, right. my LinkedIn in the chat. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Steve, for an amazing session. Um, and that's it. You have it, fellows. Let's check our chat box as um, Stephen Fox will be dropping his LinkedIn. So if you have further questions, if you have anything you want to ask him, if you still have more questions you want to ask, if you still have, you know, a lot of mentoring and all that you need, his LinkedIn is in the account, is, is, sorry, is in the chat box below. So let's do well to utilize this great opportunity that has been provided us by the Millennium Fellowship 2023. And um, on behalf of the Millennium Fellowship, we say thank you once again, Stephen Fox, for your time. I mean, we recognize that, I mean, there's a lot of things you are doing. There's a lot of businesses you are handling. There are a lot of things. But really, really thank you for uh, making out time for us. And we are really, really excited going forward. I would also have more um, opportunity and chances to interact with you and to get to know you better. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining today's session. Thank you so much for your cooperation. And um, thank you to the Millennium Campus Network Fellowship 